Shall we pray? Gracious Father, Lord, we're so grateful for this day. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and for your mercy. But Lord, we're so grateful, Lord, that we have an opportunity to come and worship you, Lord, in spirit as well as in truth. I pray, God, that you will use me as your servant today to speak a word to your people, Lord. For, Lord, where I'm fearful, Lord, I pray that you would give me courage. Lord, where I'm arrogant, I pray that you would humble me, Lord, right now. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of thy heart be acceptable, Lord, in thy sight. For you are my strength, you are my redeemer. It's in the name of Christ we pray. And all the saints of God say amen. amen. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me shall bless his holy name. From the rising of the sun to the going of the sun, yeah. Yeah. the name of the Lord is worthy to be praised. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continue to be in my mouth. My soul shall make a boast in the Lord, and the humble shall ever be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us rejoice and bless his name together. To you, this wonderful body of students, it is so good to be in front of you. As one of my favorite preachers would say, that on this day I am hyena happy, peacock proud, and elephant elated to be with you this morning. You're wondering if I can preach, and I'm wondering if you know how to pray. <laughs> Preaching and praying goes hand in hand. I want to give you a warning. I don't preach from the Newsweek magazine, the New York Times. I preach from the infallible Word of God. So I pray that you have a copy of God's Holy Word. And if you would turn your Bible or your phone to a familiar passage that will help you in your ministry as you move forward. Right now, it may not make sense to you. But if you would just stick a pen in it, I promise you'll visit it one day. Jeremiah chapter 20. <laughs> and I want to thank Dr. Didway. I call him Dr. D. I know in the rap world, they have Dr. Dre. In the academic world, we have Dr. D. Dr. Didway has credibility across culture in the African-American community as well as the white community. So he's known and so he's very respected. And I'm thankful that he gave me this opportunity to stand on this day and to work at this wonderful institution and to my other colleagues who are there. So glad to see you come to support. I'm a little bit intimidated, but I thank God he called me, so I'm here today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Listen, you may not think that this passage of Scripture is important, but I assure you one day you would visit this. I want to describe ministry like this. <laughs> Ministry, and I'm going to make up a word even though I'm an academic institution. Ministry is brutal. Brutal. Ministry can be brute, but it also can be beautiful at the same time. Sometimes ministry has a way of being so brutal to make you want to quit, and sometimes it can be so beautiful to make you want to stay. And I want to challenge you how to live between the moment when it's tough and a struggle and yet how to stay in when it gets sour. You can see in the life, in the autobiography, in Jeremiah 20, we get to read his biography of a mad prophet. <laughs> He's literally frustrated coming unglued and he speaks to the sponsor but I never heard the sponsor speak to him <laughs> what do you do when you speak but the sponsor has not spoken back to you listen to his words Jeremiah 20 verses 7 through 9 oh Lord you have deceived me <laughs> and I was deceived you have overcome me and prevailed I've become a laughing stock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For each time I speak, I cry out loud. I proclaim violence and destruction because for me, the word of the Lord has resulted in reproach and derision all day long. But if I say I would not remember him or speak anymore in his name, then in my heart, it becomes like a burning fire 
shut up in my bone. I want to speak to you from the subject, the temptation to quit. <laughs> the temptation to quit. I come this morning to give you a word of encouragement, but I also come this morning to give you a prophetic warning. <laughs> There's a virus that's going around. It's a serious virus. No, not the coronavirus, not the Ebola virus. This virus is deadly. <laughs> this virus is causing havoc on Christian leaders in Christian churches. <laughs> That's 1,700 ministers every month get this virus and they lose the ministry for good. <laughs> About 6,000 churches close this door because of this virus. I want to let you know that I'm contaminated with this virus. I'm walking around with this virus. I've been having this virus now for about 18 years. And I can't seem to get rid of it. But I'm not the only one that's had this virus. There are some men who are far greater than I who've had this virus. When I look at the landscape of the biblical text, I discovered that the law-given liberator Moses, he had this virus. Elijah, he had this virus. When I look on the landscape of some of the black scholars and some of the black civil rights leader, Martin Luther King Jr., he had this virus. Frederick Douglass, he had this virus. Gordon Calvin Taylor, he had this virus. And oh, my favorite political leader, Churchill, he even had this virus. <laughs> Charles Haddon Spurgeon, he had this virus. George W. Truett, he had this virus. And if you're not careful, you'll have this virus too. Can I tell you the symptoms of this virus? This virus has a way of penetrating your spirit. It'll poison your soul. It'll paralyze your steps. This virus, this virus, it is called the Monday morning blues. <laughs> Every Monday morning, some pastor, some Christian leader, they make their way to their studies in their own private chamber. They may get out a pen, a pad, the computer, and they begin to type their letter of resignation because they want to quit on God. <laughs> They've got to the reality, you get this virus by dealing with cantankerous church folks. Trying to lead folks who say they want a God-sized vision, but every time you try to lead them somewhere, they say, we've never done it this way before. And it puts you in a predicament that you're ready to give up, wave the white flag of surrender, and say, God, I quit. But just about when you're about to quit, throw in the towel, before you quit, remember the God who got you started. <laughs> In Jeremiah 20, we get a chance to look at the life of what I call arguably the greatest prophet in the Bible. Jeremiah, the prophet. He's a spokesman for God. He's leading in some of the darkest times. As a prophet, he is living in a more declining world. He's living in a time where sin is running rapid. He's living in a time where people don't want to hear a word from the sponsor. Jeremiah is dealing with the reality of, of injustice. He's dealing with the reality that he's been beaten, battered, and bruised at the hand of religious leaders. So this man, this prophet of God, he's getting frustrated and he want to give up on God. And I promise you, if you stay long enough in ministry, you'll want to give up on God as well. Ministry is not always a place of sunshine. There are storms in ministry. And I want you to remember when storms of ministry come your way, you can learn something. That's a fact that must be framed and a lesson that must be learned. And that is God is too legit for you to quit on. <laughs> can I just tell you on this side? God is too legit for you to quit on. Inquiring minds want to know, how can I overcome the temptation to quit? 
I'm glad you asked. You can overcome the temptation to quit by not allowing the perception of deception to become your reality. You cannot allow the perception of deception to become your reality. It's in your Bible if you haven't torn it out. <laughs> right here at verse 7. Jeremiah said, Oh Lord, you have deceived me. Lord, you have duped me. Jeremiah is dealing with the fact that God, I am questioning the deception that you have placed in my life. You have called me to ministry and I question two areas of my ministry. I question my call and I question my conception. He said, Lord, you have deceived me. Abraham Hesher would say that Jeremiah is accusing God of rape. Ralph Douglas West say that Jeremiah is accusing God of divine molestation. <laughs> that great preacher Robert Smith said that Jeremiah is accusing God of sovereign seduction and divine bullying. <laughs> Dante Wright says it this way, <laughs> I believe that he is on, of, on his Gethsemane moment this is his lowest moment in his life. And I believe that he is accusing God of unnecessary roughness. <laughs> He's challenging God. He's saying, God, God, you have divinely unnecessary roughed me up. <laughs> when you look at this in the Hebrew text, it gives a picture uh, of one who has been Raped a man who is overpowering a virgin and tossing her to the side. And so right here, Jeremiah is accusing God of unnecessarily roughing me up and throwing me away. The accusation, but he's not the only one that's accused God of something. You do know Job accused God in his moment of destroying his family and bringing an economic meltdown to his life. You do know in Psalm 22 that the psalmist accuses God of divine abandonment. But here is Jeremiah. He's accusing God of unnecessary roughness. And he's arguing with God. And he said, God, you have deceived me. You have overpowered me. And you have prevailed. What he's doing, he's talking back to God and said, God, you have done me wrong in my calling. And so what he does, he goes in his pocket and pull out his prophetic red flag. <laughs> red flag. I love football. <laughs> and the red flag in football means that the coach has decided that the official has made the wrong call on the field. And he wants to challenge it. And when he makes this challenge, the officials on the field who's at the ground level, they don't have the power to make the decision. They have to go over to the monitor. And when they go over to the monitor, they look in the monitor, but they just really look in because there's another power at a higher level. That's not even in a stadium. They're at the headquarters. And they're looking at what went on on that field, and then in return, they give information to the officials to say whether or not it's going to be overturned or it's going to stay. Jeremiah has shown his red flag. I wish you can see it. And he said, God, I need an instant replay on my life. You have called Isaiah to the ministry, but you drafted me to the ministry. And God, I need to make sure to let you know that you're guilty of a flagrant foul, unnecessary roughness. And I can hear God say, no, Jeremiah. It's no unnecessary roughness. The place stands. First down, get back in the game. When you get beat up by ministry, don't get out the game. Get back in the game. First down, God has more for you to do. He said it's the divine, the perception of deception is not only in the fact of my calling, but it's also in my conception. If you read verses 14 through 18, it's an agonizing read. Can I read it to you? Listen to his pain. He said, cursed be the day when I was born. Let the day be blessed when my mother bore me. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father saying, a baby boy is born to you 
and made him very happy. But let that man be like the city which the Lord overthrew without relenting. And let him hear an outcry in the morning and a shout of alarm at noon. Listen to verse 18. And why did I ever come forth from the womb to look on trouble and sorrow so that my days have been spent in shame? Lord, why did you even let me be born? Why did you bother me? You didn't bother the other kids in Jerusalem. When I was in my mother's womb, you put your words in my mouth. I didn't get a chance to go to the daycare center in Jerusalem and play with other little kids. From the day I was born, you had me called to do ministry. You put your words in my mouth. And all I do, I have this one sermon, death and destruction. And rather than me being happy and saying, happy birthday, I'm saying, cursed be the day I was born. <laughs> My daddy didn't, I didn't want my daddy to celebrate and go get a, get a cigar and celebrate. So I got a son. Cursed be the day I was born. Then Jeremiah, I thought he was pro-life. He said, I wish that I was still born. I wish I would have died in my mother's womb. I wish her womb was my grave. He's mad about his call. And then about his conception. <laughs> On July the 4th, 1952, <laughs> it was a cold, foggy, drizzly, muggy day. Florence Chadwick, a lady, she wanted to swim 21 miles on the Catalina Islands. From the Catalina Islands, the California coast. She wanted to be the first lady to ever do it. See, she knew something about doing long distance swimming because she had done some before. But this 21 mile journey was going to be her longest ever. And when she got in, the water was chilly, it was cold, it was foggy. When she got in, she began to swim. While she takes smooth strokes every once in a while, she would look up and all she could do is see fog before her. She'd keep on swimming. She would hear gunshots. These gunshots represented that the fact that her handlers were trying to scare the sharks off. But she kept on swimming. She kept on swimming in this frigid cold water, can't see, and finally, after swimming for about 15 hours, fatigue set in. She was tired. She asked to get out of the water, but her handler said, no, 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 you, you stay in the water. Don't, don't you get out of the water. You stay right in the water. She went back and kept on swimming. Finally, fatigue had taken over. She got out of the water and she asked a question. She said, I'm just curious, how far was I from my goal? And said, you're a mile and a half. She said, just a mile and a half? Say yes. Then she replied, she said, if only, I'm not making any excuses, but only if I could have seen the finish line, I would have stayed in the water. I want you to come closer to me. In ministry, it's going to get foggy sometime. You're going to have to face some sharks in ministry. You're going to have to deal with some chilly moments in ministry. And you may not be able to see. But I want you to remember, whenever you can't trace God, you can trust God. Keep your eyes on the finish line. No matter if you can see, God has a way of making a way out of no way. You can overcome the temptation to quit. But not just not allowing the perception or deception to become your reality, but you can overcome the temptation to quit by not allowing repeated rejection to silence your witness. Repeated rejection will silence one witness. If you would look at verse 9, Jeremiah the prophet, he tells God, I would not remember nor mention your name. He has spiritual prophetic amnesia. <laughs> He said, God, I'm never going to say your name again. I'm not going to ever speak of your name again. 
And he said, God, by the way, I want to let you know that you can take this job and you can shove it. So God, I don't want to work in this ministry no more. I'm done. He said, I, I am sick and tired of coming before you on my knees praying for the people and asking you to save the people, change the people. And then I go before the people on behalf of you and then the people still don't accept me. So God, I'm sick and tired of you sabotaging my ministry and metaphorizing me into a laughing stock in a community. There is nothing good about me. There's whispers about me. Everyone talks about me. I am the laughing stock in town. Every night, when late night at Jay Leno in Jerusalem come on, I'm the opening joke. There go that crazy mad prophet. MSNBC of Jerusalem, CNN of Jerusalem, Fox News of Jerusalem. I'm always the opening statement. The prophet goes wild. And every time I was ridiculed and hurt by calculated voices, I got hurt verses 1 through 6 by religious leader. It was the priests who made a public mockery out of me. He locked me up in stocks, and as they walked by, they told me my sermon, there go death and destruction. And I was made into a public mockery by religious folks. You do know there's a difference between folks who have a relationship with Christ and folks who only do it for a religious purpose. Folks who don't have a relationship with Christ and folks who are just in it for religion, those are the folks I'm the most scared of. Then he said, even if you watch, my enemies are trying to catch me. It's bad enough that my prophetic poll rating is at an all-time low and my enemies are after me. They want to see me trip, slip, and fall. But you know what hurt me the most, God? It's my friends. I call them my frenemies. <laughs> Another made up word. Frenemies. Your friend, but your enemy all at the same time. And God, my frenemies, they have been spreading rumors. And you know who spread the most rumors? <laughs> what I've discovered in ministry, it's the preachers who spread the most rumors. Doc, can he say it? Doc, what do you think about it? Don't even know who you are. But I want you to be so secure about who you are in ministry, whether you ever get invited anywhere. Thank God you have somewhere to go 52 weeks and that may be the only place you work at. In spite of somebody rejecting you, in spite of someone ridiculing you, remember, God is too legit for you to quit on. Yeah. Listen to this, Philip Porner, that wonderful preacher in Little Rock, Arkansas, he tells a story about a pastor friend of his who kids had a great love affair for sour patches. I don't know if you guys eat sour patches, but I try to stay away from them because I don't want anything to come loose out of my mouth that has no business coming out of my mouth. It looks kind of sticky. <laughs> You'll get that when you get home. <laughs> and Porter was saying that this father purchased three boxes of sour patches, one for him and two for his kids. When he purchased this, he gave it to his kids and he decided to eat with them and his kids was having a grand time, but yet when he was eating it, his face began to just crunch up and he was about to get ready to spit it out. And his kids said, no, 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 daddy, don't do that. Don't spit it out. Keep on chewing it. He said, why? Why would I keep chewing it? This thing is sour. And the kids reminded him, Daddy, if you keep on chewing it, eventually the sourness of the candy will turn to sweetness. I want you to know as you walk with the Lord in ministry, every now and then you will find that ministry can be sour. But you keep on walking with God and sooner or later, quicker than right now, God will make that situation sweeter than you can ever imagine. God is too legit for you to quit on. You can overcome the temptation to quit <laughs> by not allowing the perception of deception to become your reality, by not allowing repeated rejection to silence your witness. But let me take my seat. You can overcome the temptation to quit by deciding to trust God in spite of the pressure of ministry. 
Can I show you the pressure of ministry? In spite of the pressure of ministry, look at verse number 11. Verse number 11, he goes and says, but the Lord. Conjunction, conjunction, what's your function? (laughs) Whatever was bad on the back end, it's going to get good on the front end. He said, but the Lord is with me. For the very first time, he's come to recognize that God is with him. He said that the Lord is with him. You you know what the psalmist says, the Lord is my refuge and my strength, a very present help in a time of trouble. The Lord is my help and strength, a very present help in a tight spot. He realized that God is with him in a tight spot. And, And what God has really been doing with him the whole time, God has been spotting him. Can I help you out? Me and my son, we work out together. We lift weights. And I always tell my son, when you go to the weight room, son, don't you go and try to bench press a whole lot of weight without having a spotter. I said, I know you think you're strong, son, but you need a spotter. So one day I walked off and he decided he was going to put 225 pounds on the bar. And I walked off like a daddy from a far distance and I'm looking and I'm laughing at the same time because I told that boy, don't lift that weights without having a spotter. He put the weight down and as I saw him trying to get ready to lift it up, I got that little cool step in my movement because I wanted to get to my son because I didn't want my son to get hurt and the weights came down and I got there quicker and it dropped down on him and he was struggling and I caught it right there at that moment I said son keep on pushing he said I can't I said yes you can keep on pushing he pushed and I got him up he said dad I did it I said no we did it (laughs) I reminded him if I was not there that weight would have crushed him But because I was there with him, I was able to spot him even when the weight was on him. I want you to know when you find yourself in a tight situation, the text lets us know God will spot us. He said he will help him prevail. He made his enemies a disgrace. The tables have now turned and then I love it because I have to take my seat. He moved from the reality to realizing the presence of God. Then he decided, I'm going to praise God. Can I see verse 10? I cannot leave you without giving you no hope in the text. Verse 13 helps me out. Sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord. For he has delivered the soul of the needy one. He is not guilty of spiritual plagiarism. He gave credit to the one who delivered him. Let, let me help you out. I, I got to take my seat up. Uh, I used this illustration before. Uh, I hadn't used it, well, last time I used it was in 2008, but I think it'll help today. Uh, I don't want to date myself, but one of my favorite TV shows, I still watch it today. Don't tell nobody. It's Popeye. Boy, when I was a little boy, and still today, I still think I'm a little boy. Popeye would come on, and I love that theme song. I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. Boop, boop. I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. Boop, boop. I'm strong to the finish, because I eat me spinach. I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. Boop, boop. Oh, I would go wild. I still go wild. But oh, I learned some theology from Popeye. Popeye used to date this ugly girl. I know I'm in a Christian school. You shouldn't say that. Forgive me, Professor Wright. Ooh, he used to date Olive Oil, and Olive Oil was a two-timer and a cheater. And boy, she would be with Popeye and hang out with Popeye, and when big old sexist Bruto would come, she would leave old Popeye. And she would go with the next best thing. And when she would leave with Popeye, Popeye would have his head down. He's depressed. He's broke. He busted. He's disgusted. The love of his life is gone. And Popeye just put his head down. And all of a sudden, when life gets bad, and Bruto turns on Olive Oil, she began to holler, Popeye! And Popeye already knew Bruto has beat him up. 
But Popeye, he, he awakens because he hears the voice of his sweetie olive oil. And Popeye is trying to figure out how am I going to go defeat that big bad Bruto? What Popeye needed to know, he didn't need to know how he was going to figure out to defeat him. What he needed was already on him. What Papa had inside of him was the secret to his sauce. Papa had spinach inside of him. And when Papa knew that he had spinach, he discovered, I can defeat old Bruto. Can't you see Papa reaching inside of his shirt? Papa eating his spinach. When Papa get his spinach, his body transformed. When his body transformed, he goes to Bruto, knocks Bruto out, get his sweetie olive oil. He walks away. I'm Papa the sailor man. Boop, boop. I'm Papa the sailor man. Boop, boop. I'm strong to the finish because I eat me spinach. I'm Papa the sailor man. Now, what does that mean to you? When you find yourself under the pressure of ministry, because some bully in ministry has taken advantage of you. Don't you quit. God is too legit for you to quit on. God has placed something inside of you that if you would just rely on the resource of the Holy Spirit, God will pull you out of that miry clay and get you out of the right direction. I'm Popeye the Sailor, man. Boop, boop. 